So I was conflicted and thinking these were only the, the only sacred vocations. But then I started thinking, well, wait a minute. What about doctors, social workers, environmentalists? They're helping people. That's their full-time job, right? They save, these, these folks save lives. These folks save emotional lives. These folks make our lives comfortable and safe. They make sure that we don't exploit the environment and consume the resources and end up breathing junk. Those must be the sacred vocations. One of my best buddies is a carpenter. And boy, can he relate. He does carpentry full-time and pastoring full-time. So he was he provided a great insight. But then I said, well, wait a minute. Mechanics, carpenters, transportation experts, engineers, there's got to be purpose there. There's got to be a way to, to understand and better explore what it means to be in concert with God's purpose and use these vocations as a sacred place to minister to others and to guide activities towards his purposes. So my, my, my conclusion was that God intends for our work to be a holy endeavor through which we seek to fulfill his purposes as one element, one element of, of several sacred vocations in our lives. What are those vocations? Our vocation in our home, our vocation in the community, our vocation in the church, and yeah, our vocation in the office or in the, or in the workplace. Vocation is a calling towards God's purpose. We have roles that we play in each of those domains. Martin talked the other day about the, the studies you guys have been going through in terms of the purpose-driven life, I believe it was, and how, how we take courageous. that into our, um, courageous, uh -huh. how we take that into our home. Well, that's a sacred place. If we seek to fulfill God's purpose in our home, with our family, even with all the garbage we carry around with us, we turn that into, we turn fatherhood and husbandry into a sacred vocation. The same thing in work. And we talked about, talk about this relationship, this upward inward relationship. I want to want to bring the thought of an integrated, balanced lifestyle of family and community. Because the other problem that I've had for years is over emphasis on work. I'm at fault for putting 60, 70 hour weeks in on a routine basis and then going in on weekends to, to help people. Because I thought that's what I was being asked to do. There were people that were counting on me. Guess what? My family was at home without me. And he knows some of the tragedy that can happen. And we've shared those with one another as to what can happen if you're absent from the home. It's not that you're a bad person. You're just not there when the kids need you. You're not there at those moments when the wife is just beyond her wits and she's dealing with tough problems and they need a dad to talk to or a husband to talk to. So balanced lifestyle is really important in this whole framework that we've been talking about. And it starts with that denying self and looking upward to Christ as a daily, moment-by-moment -moment walk. But it also says let's not get overly preoccupied with one aspect of our vocations in life. It needs to, to have balance. We need to strike that balance. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. It's working for the Lord, not for men. It is Christ you are serving. And this is, this is all of life. In our home, in the work, in church, in community. Martin put this model up the other day. What I want to talk about is that entire balance. We spoke specifically, and we're going to zero in here on work, but it's really sacred vocation of all aspects of our life. If we can take the time that we are together in church to really, no kidding, focus together as a community, but extend that through all aspects of our life and find community opportunities in the home, community opportunities in the work, reach out to one another as we are here as brothers in Christ and seek that support, the iron sharpening iron support, to supplement that upward inward cycle in a relationship with God. We're then able to take that in this outward response and interact with others. Martin Luther talked about vocation as being a mask of God. In fact, in his, his, his there's let me let me quote something for you. He said
He said, respond to a calling in the workplace or in the home as an occupation that becomes sacred callings analogous to those of priests, nuns, and monks. He rightly saw the whole world as a theater of God's glory and insisted that working in the world had value to God. He's prepared works in advance for us to do, not just in the time that we invest in our, our, our church and our family, but in our work. And Luther, at the foundational level, understood this and conveyed it in, in much of his teaching. The idea that the entire, our entire life is a holy endeavor. God's theater, this entire scope of our, of our life, is that sacred vocation. And if we look to our work as simply an opportunity to glorify God, it begins that foundational framework to us, for us to translate that activity into a sacred vocation. So I want to explore this idea of calling. In fact, uh, I, I brought the book today. I apologize for not having uh, this in the, in the handouts. But this author, Charles Drew, talks about calling as part of exploring and, and finding your purpose in life. What's the name of the book? It's called A Journey Worth Taking, Finding Your Purpose in the World. And so I, we'll get that out in the email. And what's the uh, author? It's Charles Drew. D-R-E-W. In fact, this, this basic concept comes directly from this book, and it's, it's the framework for his book. It talks about four levels of calling. God calls us to himself. We've been, we've been talking about that over these last several weeks. He calls us to his people. He calls us to a deep understanding of who we are. I mean, and I'm going to expand on that in, in detail here this, this morning. And then he calls us to service. This is the idea of, of community. And, and the, the posit that he presents in his book and, and that I'm exploring is that this calling and these aspects of calling help us to understand our purpose in our work. So from that, from that foundation, we draw that. And I say that we should view our work through a lens of one who seeks to fulfill God's purpose as a sacred endeavor in our workplace. So imagine changing our paradigms around our, our workplace. And tomorrow, when you, or Monday, when you go into the office, hopefully you're not going anywhere. When we go into the office Monday, we're seeking and, and have our radar on, looking for opportunities to fulfill his purpose. Those opportunities could be ministry. It could be, you know, witnessing. It could be a Bible study. But it can also be how you affect those around you, the customers you serve in the quality of the services you provide, in the integrity in which you apply to your work, in seeing God work his hands in, in work that you see as impossible for you to do. Barnes talked about that. And also in influencing those around you towards his purposes, literally aligning the activity of a group that you may influence towards his purposes. Even if those folks don't, at that moment, have a relationship with God, you can bring them towards that relationship just by your own witness in the way you live and the way you act and the way you, you respond in those moments, particularly in those moments where stewardship and creativity are, are opportunities to convey your Christian faith. People will be drawn to Christ. If you empty yourself out as a vessel and allow the Holy Spirit to motivate your actions and your words, people will be drawn to Christ. And that's what we're talking about in the workplace. So how do we under, how do we look to our work from a standpoint of his purpose? First of all, we talk in, in that, that calling, glorifying him and knowing him. That's what we've been talking about these last several weeks. I can come to know him better and more intimately through my response to him and how that response is manifest in my work. And I can glorify him in that, in that regard. I can draw others to Christ simply by my words and actions, by my consistency and the integrity with which I apply resources, the consistency with which I apply prudence in how I talk to people, how I deal with situations where someone might be griping about their work or griping about their boss or griping about a colleague, how I respond to that interaction. 
do I engage them in the griping? I've done it. Or instead, do I say, Lord, help me here. I'm thinking about myself right now. I'm just as ticked off at that, at that boss as they are. Boy, would I like to slam the boss. Lord, inform me, influence me, calm me, help me to deny self. Help me to respond to this person. This may actually be an opportunity to witness, and I don't even see it if I'm not looking for it. Help me. Now, that is tough in an instantaneous response. If we are not in this continuous walk, we're going to struggle with those responses, and we're going to say, say words and behave in a manner that we're going to regret. Earn our heart towards the possible. And then say, and you know what? My experience has been that if I deny self, and seek God, even in the situation where I've got a tough job to do, I'm at peace. I'm more efficient. I'm more focused. And you can be too. Coming to know ourselves and our unique gifts. And I'm going to give you some tools here in a little bit to help us do this. He wants us to know ourselves, and I extend that to the idea of giftedness. We are all given gifts. We talk about the body of Christ, right? And we each have a role in that body. We're all unique. We're diverse. You know, he didn't design us all to be the same. He designed us all uniquely individual and giftedness that is different and unique from everyone else. And as a community, we can come together with that giftedness and make amazing things happen. Think of an orchestra. A soloist is great, but you get a group of talented musicians together, and all of a sudden you got wonderful harmony, right? Martin talked about his experiences. I'm a musician, too. I used to play lots of solos when I was growing up. Thought it was really cool, but what was really neat was being in a quartet, a quintet, a jazz band, an orchestra. That's where real music happens. So we take that individual giftedness and we seek our role as an instrument to fulfill his purposes as part of the orchestra, not as a soloist. Now there are times for solo performances, don't get me wrong, and God blesses that as well if you do it in, in concert with his purposes. But I think he's looking for more than that from us. He's looking for us to engage one another in this process. Joining him in mutual support of community, especially in the work. Because if we can help others to know him and glorify him and help them to know themselves and understand their unique gifts, they then fulfill their own life purposes. I talk about two aspects of purpose. God has a purpose for my life, but he also has a purpose through my life. What does that mean? He's going to put us in situations if we are in concert with his purpose and maintaining that relationship with him and allowing the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. He's going to place you in places that's going to fulfill his mission, and you may not even know it until you look back at it and say, my goodness, I was the most surprised person in that conversation. So it's not just, Lord, you wired me to be a carpenter. How do I make carpentry glorify you? It's also, how do I, in the, in, the, in the movement of carpentry, in my day-to-day -day walk as a carpenter, how do I help others see you and come to know you and come to understand their giftedness and fulfill their purpose for you? And in so doing, if I can bring them to Christ, allow their life to fulfill your purpose through their life as well as in their life, for their life, okay? So when I think of purpose, I think of it in those two dimensions. <coughs> for my life, Lord, you wired me as an engineer. What do you want me to do? How do you want me to apply my stewardship and creativity responsibilities to glorify you? But also, in the journey of engineering, how do you want me to affect the purposes through my life to help others come to know you, to know their, their own giftedness, and to come to understand how to glorify you? Engaging in that stewardship and creative process. That's what gets back to the, to, the, to the basic premise here, and that is God wired us for relationship. He gave us stewardship and creativity, partnerships with him. We are partners in a continuous creative process. What's that creative process? Fulfilling his purpose for and through our life. Engaging in the continuous process of co-creation and utilizing these, these gifts. That's the basic underpinning of what we're, we're about to talk to. What are these gifts? How do I understand what they are? How do I know how to apply them in my work? And how does that translate into not only my relationship with him, 
I'm in response to that relationship in that workplace. The health and strength of our spiritual life, which is what we've been talking about. This upward inward relationship, this, this what I call cycle of renewal. It is a continuous walk, not just a walk for an hour or two once a week when we enter the sanctuary, that sacred place where we can really focus, but an hour to hour, daily, daily walk with him. The health of that spiritual life will shape our willingness and ability to respond to his guidance through this upward gaze, engaging him as active partners in co-creation and stewardship of his kingdom. His kingdom now and eternal. I maintain that our work has eternal purpose in the way we affect community. The eternal purpose may not be fulfilled in the railing that you put up tomorrow when you're helping someone remodel their home or in the ledger sheet that you're looking at to ensure that a pension plan is secure. It may not be. It may be. It may be that that pension system being secure allows individuals to fulfill purposes in their lives that might be leaving work and getting into a retirement and having a full-time mission. You don't know. But I'll tell you, when you invest in others, when you take the, 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 the opportunity to witness to them, when someone probes you and says, why is it that you always are bubbling over with, with joy in the midst of sorrow? What's going on? That has eternal purpose. And I would maintain that in your workplace, you have trust relationships. How many, how many can think of an individual or individuals that would look up to you or look to you as a brother in confidence, whether they know God or not, mm -hmm. right? Think about those trust relationships as an opportunity for witness. Think about the opportunity to draw those people towards Christ by simply living a Christ-like life or by simply responding to the griping situation that says, you know what, I know the boss is, you know, off base maybe this morning. Who knows? Maybe he can't. Maybe he, maybe this is dictated. Maybe if we don't go do this, where he's going to lose the job and we won't get a follow-on contract from this customer. But I can engage that conversation, that trust relationship, because if I violate that trust relationship and I establish a relationship of griping in those trust conversations, how have I manifest Christ in their life? In fact, I might have gotten in the way of God's eternal purpose for them. That conversation might very well be the Holy Spirit nudging that individual towards you because that individual respects you and sees in you the light of God. And in that moment, if you are constantly aware of your relationship with Christ and, the, and allowing the Holy Spirit to move you, it won't require a prayer in that moment. You won't, it won't require for you to just pause and say, Lord, give me discernment here. How do I respond? Because your instinctive response will be Christ. It won't be self. And now those trust relationships become a powerful ministry in the workplace. And that's what I was missing for 25 years. I was trying to be a really good guy. And I would vacillate between, yeah, let's write about the boss and let's, let's see what's, what, what's on your heart today. What can I help you with? Oh, you want to talk about the boss? Okay, let's talk about the boss. Let's jam on the boss. And I came to realize, no, I've got to, I've got to you know, relate to that individual by getting out of the way and letting Christ speak in that moment, particularly in those trust relationships. Because the minute I violate that trust relationship or I misuse the relationship and guide that person down a path where their head rather than their heart is focused not on, on a relationship with God but on something that self is motivating them to feel. Once I use that trust relationship to, to, to do that, I've done maybe irreparable harm to that individual. So witness in the office doesn't require that you walk over to the Bible every time someone walks in your office. It'd, it'd be great if we could do that. Some bosses wouldn't even let you do that, right? But you know what? All of this speaks, and it speaks loudly in our response to those situations and how we interact with others. And we can't do that, and what Martin's been talking about these last several weeks is we can't do that from a position of weakness and a spiritual well-being. We've got to have that solid foundation. We've got to maintain that intimate, constant conversation so that in, in, instinctively we're, out of, we're getting out of the way and we're manifesting Christ in those situations, particularly in the trust relationships, and extending the power of the Holy Spirit through our daily walk into those trust relationships. 
So let's talk more specifically about those responses. Coming to know God. We talk, we've been talking about this upward-inward cycle. Now I want to talk about that outward response. Basically what we're saying is, in this process, this cyclic process, this continuous denying self and seeking God, rather than responding from the flesh in those situations, we respond through the, through the insight and the influence of the Holy Spirit. We manifest Christ in our response. And now we want to talk about coming to know ourselves and our unique gifts. Because in those relationships, and how many folks have had other people at work come to you and say, I, I need some career advice? Particularly if it's a young person. I, I get this all the time. I get engineers that are maybe three or four years into their career, and they're lost. They don't know what they're doing. Or at least they don't feel that way. And they come for advice. Okay? One of the things I try to do is to try to understand, what are your gifts? What are you good at? What do you like to do? And are you getting a chance to apply what you like to do and what you're good at in your workplace? Because if you, the only place you get to do that is in your hobbies or church. You're not, you're not, you know, not even able to start this sacred vocation in all aspects of life. So sometimes I advise folks that come to me for counsel to find another job because they're just in the wrong position. Why? Because their, their giftedness is not aligned with their work, and therefore they can't be an instrument to fulfill God's purpose. Whether they know it or not, that's what God intends for them. So I want to talk about giftedness, and I'm going to walk through two tools, and this one is powerful. This takes a spiritual perspective of giftedness and through some very simple questions allows you to gain some insight from a scriptural foundation as to what my giftedness is. And then for the workplace, specifically, there's something called people management. I'm going I'm to show you more about this in a second. It allows you to literally understand whether or not you are well matched to the job you have. I had this analysis done on me at 18 years old. My father was getting trained in the process. So he's a human resource expert, and I was a guinea pig. One page summary of what my giftedness is. That piece of paper is so yellowed and dog-eared now. It sits in my office, and every time someone says, I got an opportunity for you. I mean, how many times have you heard that? Thinking, oh, boy, I wonder what's attached to this. <laughs> but when it was, I got a new job, I pull that dog-eared piece of paper out, and I reread it. And it was so powerful to provide me insight as to where God wanted me to go. Even in my confusion about tilling the cursed ground, it provided me the, the insight on top of the spiritual giftedness to really understand, is this an opportunity? Is this really where I should be going? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna provide you s uh, some insight into those tools. And I give you both because the spiritual foundation is most critical and then the the, what I'll call the, the, you know, the workplace and the skills foundation is also very insightful. So the fundamental question is, do you understand your gifts and, do you, and are you developing? Remember we, we talked earlier, one of his purposes is to know who we are, understand our giftedness, and apply that to his glory. Well, how are we going to apply our giftedness to his glory if we don't know what our giftedness is? Right? Pretty, pretty, you know, and that's, that to me, at 18 years old, is wonderful because my dad provided me that insight. I, I love him. These guys know him. I mean, he's just a wonderful man. And he's, he's got giftedness for, that are just amazing, right? Cool guy. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what it means in terms of scriptural truth. Just as each of us is one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we are many for we are we are many from one body, and each member belongs all to the others, and we each have different gifts according to the grace given us. This made perfect sense to me when I read it and thought about my role as a youth as a part-time youth minister. It made perfect sense. Lord, you gave me a love for kids. I'm going to apply that love in youth ministry. So in the context of church, it, made it was sense. it made perfect sense to me. Right, as a full-time pastor or minister, this—I've heard my my pastor buddies talk about this often. We are the body of Christ. We are here to glorify God. We're here to combine our giftedness as one body. No gift is more important than the other. Right? We've we've heard that before, and it made perfect sense to me in the church. I maintain that this makes even 
as perfect as sense in the workplace. Here are the spiritual gifts, and there's an uh, online, and I'll, I'll send you this hot link, but the, hot, the link is gift test. It's really easy to, to remember, gift test. This, this was developed by one of the um, um, instructors at Regent University. And it has been proliferated across many, many avenues. In fact, if you just go on the internet and, and do a Google search on spiritual inventory, you'll find churches and, and even some uh, businesses using this as a, as a way to help people discern what God wired them for. And it doesn't take long to do. I just did this again the other night and basically what you do is you go in here and answer questions. Um, I give generously and joy joy joyfully to people in need. That's one question. And you say, is this absolutely not true, or is it true all the time, or somewhere in between? A series of question like that, questions like that to really draw from the book of Romans. In fact, if you continue reading, you'll see in the, in the subsequent verses of, ch of chapter 12, these gifts are outlined. By Paul. So the get test uh, form is more than five or six. Yes, topics. it's a whole page. I just, I just trunk. You know, there's, oh, I probably 30, 40 questions, and it comes at each one of these giftedness from different perspectives. Okay, it it asks multiple ways to help discern if you have a tendency in one or more of these areas. Now there is the the dean of Regent University would argue that our goal in life is to develop all of these gifts to the maximum intent. Okay? That may or may not be possible. It's certainly not possible by our own willpower. But I believe all things are possible through God's power, right? But you will get a very, very clear understanding of where your heart is when you do this test. And you get it in a very simple form. And, and the, after you take this inventory, this screen will pop up in this little list here. By giftedness will tell you how strong you are in that gifted area. And it does one more thing. And it, it helps you discern what that means. Not just in your witness to Christ in a community of believers, but it helps you to begin to understand how do I witness to Christ in a community of non-believers, in a workplace, in my local community, in my home powerful insight. So it's taken these the, the teachings of, of, of Paul and it's put that into very meaningful terms. And the, the work, this, this was the work of, of one of the, the researchers at the university literally did their entire doctoral thesis on this idea. So it's well founded. Many, many theologians and social scientists have come together to help this individual with, with this series of questions, so that these questions are, no kidding, valid representations of what Paul was talking about here. So it really is informed by the power of the Holy Spirit. These people at Regent are not, are, they're all strong believers. They witness to, to their faith in their lectures, in their behavior, and in their interaction with students. These are, and some of them are world-renowned theologians. These are, these aren't people that just took Paul's writings and came up with a bunch of questions just to, to be cute about it. A lot of discernment went into this, yes. I want to expose you to one more thing, and that's another tool. And we're going to send you this link. This is like the other. is an online tool, and it basically looks at your what's called motivated abilities. God's wired you to do certain things. And how do you know that? It's simple. What I, you ask, answer two questions. What do you like to do, and why do you, why do you think you do it well? And this, this is built upon principles that look to patterns in your life where you find reasons to be happy. And God wired you that way. And most of the time, when you are doing something you like and you think you do it well, you're probably applying the gifts that God gave you. And so that insight against the backdrop of the spiritual awareness of your giftedness is a powerful self-awareness that allows you to find opportunities in your career, in your home, in the church, to apply your gifts towards his purpose. I would highly recommend taking this. What it will do is after you answer those questions, it fits the, the, your response into these major categories. The abilities you're motivated to use, do you analyze, do you organize, do you persuade? Preferred subject matter, do I like details? Do I like people? Do I like concepts? 
preferred circumstances. Do I like stress? Some people like stress. Some people like structure. Some people are really motivated by novelty or just difficulty. And what are the preferred relationships you have with others? Do I like to be alone? Do I like to be with a leader? Do I like to be with a group? Do I like to have folks working for me and help influence? It will give you powerful insight. This is a very lengthy survey. You need probably a half hour to take it. It will generate a report, much like the spiritual survey, but what these folks have done is they've taken these correlations and they've provided career guidance. And like I said, I, I, my dad did this for me. It wasn't reduced to an algorithm 30 years ago, longer than that. And, and so now the, the, the cool thing is, is you can actually gain insight. And it'll, it'll spit out a report for 10 bucks. It's, it's, it, there is a fee for this. 10 bucks, it'll spit out a report, and you can use that as insight to making career choices. It's powerful. And we will, I'll send, I'll send, I'm going to send you these links in this week's update. So you'll have the links in there. We'll, I'll have the yep. stuff there for you. And it's real easy to, to navigate. It says take survey. In this case, if you want to spit out a report, it says give me 10 bucks. But, it, but, the, but the survey still is pretty insightful. All right. We talk about joining him in the mutual support of community, engaging our community in our work. Drawing others to Christ, we talked about our trust relationships, reflecting Christ, and engaging in godly activities in the workplace. What does that mean? Being responsive to our stewardship and our co-created partnership with him. And in the moment when we have those decisions, is this a godly activity? Am I engaging God in the task? Am I allowing him to take me beyond what I know I'm capable of doing? And that doesn't mean starting a Bible study. It doesn't necessarily have to be a it Bible study. It can be. But it's not the, in other words, the godly activities are not just having a Bible study. It's the way we, it's the way we respond to people. In fact, this response is, is a critical way of response. When, in addition to your trust relationships, if you, with this insight, if you can share this insight with others, just as a witness, you know what, I've discovered what God wired me for. And if you can do that in a, in a manner that, that reflects Christ, talk about drawing people to Christ and helping them to discover his purpose. And then helping them then to apply that giftedness. Engaging in the stewardship is identifying those resources around you. We talked about that. And act in a manner responsible to your stewardship responsibilities. Even in the conversations with others. We ha now have one less week to do our job. That's a, that's a resource that got taken away from me. How do I use the resources I have to be successful? Invest in those around you. You have stewardship responsibilities for the people you work with. Think of them as a unique, gifted creation of God, and how do I invest in, their, in them? And engaging in this continuous process of co-creation to basically seek and fulfill his purpose. Final thought. Here we are. I, got to <laughs> I, I, I alluded to this earlier. Really, the separation between the sacred and the secular workplace doesn't come from your choice of career. It comes from the decisions you make in every moment within the workplace. It comes not from the choice of profession, but the choices we make within our selected profession. And I bring us back to Ephesians 2.10. For God, we are God's workmanship. We are unique and gifted creations of God. We are partners with him in stewardship and creativity. And he's actually prepared those things that he wants us to do in advance. We may not even know them. What I've tried to do is provide some illumination of how we can come to know him more by getting to know ourselves, getting to know his purpose in our life, and then using this, this trust relationship with him as a way to get out of the way and allow him to push us in that direction.